Hello my stellar friends, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu and you're watching my instructional video about High Frontier Falls, module 2, the one about colonization. If you didn't already see my previous series of three videos about the core rules for these games, nor my two dedicated videos about module 0 and module 1, I strongly invite you to stop watching now and see all these videos before this one. You'll need them to understand what will follow. That being said, welcome to module 2, Colonization, where I will teach you all you need to know about spreading colonies throughout the solar system. More precisely, we will see three new topics for High Frontier. First, burnholes. Burnholes are huge space stations intended to shelter human colonies on orbits close to planets or comets. Then, we will see colonists, so the people who will live far from planet Earth and proudly bear your colors. And last, we will talk about futures, their long-term goals that you will give to your people and your colonists. And at the end of this video, I will recap everything in a brief overview that I hope will leave you with a clear picture. Ok, so let's start as quickly as possible, let's start with Burnholes. A Burnhole is shown in the game as a special plastic figure. Each player has two of them. The first one is the Kalpana Burnhole, a rotating cylinder that reproduces Earth gravity. The other is the Stanford Taurus, a rotating torus. Whatever the technology, a burnhole is made to shelter large human settlements in space. In game terms, both burnholes are strictly identical. Each player can build two burnholes and only two, and that's why there are two plastic figures per player. Ok, ok, but why would you need a burnhole? In a nutshell, there are two different uses for your burnholes. First, you can create a burnhole as your home burnhole. A home burnhole is a space station you build close to the Earth on a special seven-pointed star dot and that you use as your own private LEO low Earth orbit. This becomes your civilization's home. It gives you money, shelter and privileges. But you can also settle a burnhole far from the Earth, let's call it a remote burnhole, a space station linked to remote sites with factory on them, and such a burnhole acts as an industrial center, a remote colony, very efficient to harvest resources and produce items. Both types of burnholes also attract specialized colonists who work for you and increase your efficiency. Ok, let's suppose now that I convince you that you need your own burnhole, hole and so it's time to see how it all works. First, burnholes are cards. There are 10 burnhole cards in the game and they constitute a new deck in the market, the ninth deck. So, with the standard research operation, a player can buy a burnhole card by bidding on it, as we already know. Beware, a player cannot bid on a burnhole card if he already owns two burnhole cards. A player can never own more than two burnholes, whether in hand or on the map. Then, because the burnhole card in his hand is a wide card, the player can boost it to LEO, low earth orbit. Burnhole's mass being always 10, it costs 10 aquas to boost it to LEO. That's a lot. Once in LEO, a burnhole can move like a rocket. It can also carry other cards, like a rocket. A burnhole has its own stack on a new special mat, where the player puts all cards that this burnhole carries. And because each player can have two burnholes, there are two such stacks. One for the Kalpana cylinder figure and one for the Stanford Taurus. So, let's see on an example how it works more precisely. Yellow player just bought a burnhole card last turn with the research operation. Now he boosts it to LEO, but this burnhole needs a support card to work properly. It needs a generator. So yellow player also boosts a generator card he had in his hand. 
The total cost is 14. Yellow player pays 14 aquas. Both cards are put in the burner stack and the burner figure is put on the map to show that this burner is now in LEO. From then, the burner is a spacecraft and as such it can move every turn. The burner has its own thrust triangle and fuel strip. The spacecraft's total mass is 14, we show that on the fuel strip with a dry mass counter. A burner thrust triangle is always grey, so it uses dirt fuel. On a site with an ISRU, a crew or a robonaut, or at a factory, it could fill its fuel strip with as much dirt as its player wants, and this would be a free action. But here, yellow burner is in LEO, so it cannot do that. The only way to fill its fuel tanks is to convert a blue liquid fuel to grey dirt fuel. Here, for example, yellow player spends 6 aquas from LEO to add 6 points of dirt fuel in his burn hole. And now, yellow player moves his burn hole exactly like a rocket. Burn hole's net thrust is only 1, a base of 3 minus 2 for mass category. So, yellow burn hole moves to the cycler dot. And because it is pink, it spends 3 units of fuel according to its thrust triangle. Then, it moves one dot further and must do a belt roll to cross the Van Allen belt. Yellow player rolls a 3 and it's ok. Yellow Bernal cannot enter another pink dot because it has no thrust anymore, so it waits until next turn to move again. And then, next turn, it enters the Earth Luna Lagrange, spending its last 3 units of fuel. Just note before going further that because there's only one burn hole special fuel strip, you cannot move both your burn holes during the same turn. You can move your Kalpana burn hole or your Stanford Taurus, but not both. Ok, now you know how to build and move a burn hole, but as you can see, a moving burn hole is just a bad rocket and it's not the better way to use it. The idea behind moving your burn hole is to bring it to a point where you will anchor it. A useful burn hole is an anchored burn hole. Anchoring is an operation. With a red dot because it can trigger a glitch. If there is a glitch marker on the burn hole stack, the anchoring operation will require a glitch roll. This is explained in my third video about core rules. You cannot anchor a burn hole just anywhere. First, you can anchor a burn hole on a home orbit. Home orbits are shown on the map as 7 pointed stars. There are 10 possible home orbits on the map. Here, yellow player brought his burn hole to a home orbit so he can do an anchoring operation. He just decommissioned all burn holes support chain, one generator card in our example, and voila, the burn hole is anchored. Unlike when you create a factory, anchoring a burn hole decommissions all these burn hole support chain, even radiators. To show the anchoring, a dome is put on top of the burn hole figure. A dome is a colony, so as soon as a burn hole is anchored, it is supposed that humans are inside, so no more glitches and felonies become possible or felony avoidance during anarchy, of course. Beware, even if there is a human inside symbol on every burn hole card, there is no human as long as the burn hole is not anchored. An anchored burn hole cannot move anymore, it cannot activate its thrust triangle anymore. So, a home burn hole is a burn hole anchored on a home orbit. A player can have only one home burn hole, he cannot anchor his second burn hole on another home orbit. And why would you have a home burn hole? First, a home burn hole has its own privilege. It is written on its card. Here, if this burn hole is a home burn hole, yellow player no longer suffers from budget cuts. Budget Cuts is a special event for Yellow Season. Each burn hole has its own home burn hole privilege. Ok, but home burn hole brings another privilege, the faction privilege. As you remember, each faction has its own privilege and it is written on this faction's crew card. When you play with module 2, 
players don't benefit from this privilege anymore until they build and anchor a home burnal. Here, yellow player gets the blink telescope privilege, a possible reroll on every prospection operation with Reagan ISRU. So, playing with module 2, yellow player doesn't get this bonus until he builds and anchors a home burnal. Moreover, your home burnal becomes some kind of private LEO. First, it becomes your bank. All your aquas previously stocked in LEO are now located in your home burnal. And every turn, your home burnal produces a regular income of one aqua per turn. Then, the home burnal inherits from most of LEO capabilities. Yellow player can sell black cards there with a free market operation. He can bring his glory cheats there also. He can respawn his crew there when decommissioned. He can also choose to do that on the actual LEO instead, as previously. He can also boost cards from his hand directly to home burnal, but with a double cost. And finally, home burnal is a shelter. No solar flares and no pad explosions for cards in its stack. Okay, this is for your home burnal, usually the first burnal you build and anchor. But you have a second burnal, and it cannot be a second home burnal, only one home per player. Usually, here is how things unfold. So you settle the home burnal. Now, with the research operation, you bid on and buy a second burnal card. And as soon as you get this card, you put it in your home burnal stack. That means that you don't have to boost it. It's free and your second burnal can start to move by itself from the location of your home burnal. This is a capability of home burnals. Later, yellow player can boost or bring a generator to the stack and build his second burnal as a Stanford Taurus, for example, ready to move as an autonomous spacecraft with its own thrust triangle. Here, through multiple turns, yellow second burnal moves up to the Coronis Comets family, where he previously settled the factory, then a colony, a dome on a cube. There, he can anchor his burnal to his adjacent colony. This is the second way to anchor a burnal. And then, it's the same thing as we previously saw. Yellow player decommissions his burnal support chain, and he puts a new dome on the burnal itself to show that it is now anchored. Okay, so this new burnal is not a home burnal because it wasn't built on a home orbit. Let's call it a remote burnal. And as you will see, a remote burnal is very different from a home burnal. First, it is not built on a home orbit but adjacent to an existing colony. Note that a burnal can never be built on a hazard or a lander burn. A burnal cannot be built either directly on a site. It is a space station dedicated to orbit in space. And according to international laws, a burnal cannot anchor to the moon, Luna in the game. You are not limited to only one such burnal. If you choose not to have home burnal at all, you can dedicate both your burnals to remote orbits. A remote burnal doesn't unlock any privileges. In particular, the home privilege written on the burnals card does not apply if this is a remote burnal. And if a player has no home burnal, a remote burnal is not enough to unlock his faction privilege. Of course, a remote burnal cannot at all be used as an LEO and it doesn't give you any income. And so what's left? Ah yes, a remote burnal acts as a shelter for your cards in its stack, but a shelter only against solar flares because there's no pad explosion out of LEO. So that's very thin. And as you can imagine, there are some other advantages specific to remote burnals. Mainly, a remote burnal is an industrial hub. Every factory adjacent to the burnal is called a dirt side. That means that this factory is linked to the burnal and can directly produce to it. So, the first colony that was used to anchor the burnal is a dirt side, but also any other factory built previously or later, on any adjacent site. 
And remember that hazards and lender burns don't count toward adjacency. So here, yellow burn hole can be the center of a huge network of factories. Every dirt side, that is, every factory adjacent to a burn hole can do ET production and refuel operations directly toward the burn hole itself. Here, with S and D type factories, yellow player can produce S and D cards on their black side directly to the burn hole stack without having to transport them with any rocket or freighter, without having to lift off from this site, and even without having to pass through the hazard dots. A burner linked to Mars dirt sites, for example, could produce without having to worry about transporting cards out of a 10 size site. And so you can see such a burner like a super space elevator. This is true also for the refuel operation. A dirt site factory can produce 7 units of fuel or 1 unit of isotope fuel directly into the burn hole stack. From your burn hole, you can use a freighter, for example, to transport your production elsewhere. Freighters with the factory only limitation can still load from a burn hole. And if you own a freighter on its purple side, so if you own a freighter fleet, you can do a special operation on your remote burner, the nanofacture operation. As you remember, a freighter on its purple side transforms all your factories into mobile factories. And with the nanofacture operation, you can build a new factory directly inside your remote burner. On our example, Yellow Player can produce with ET production a refinery from site S, a robonode from site D, then the required reactor with its radiator. All these cards, being ET produced from dirt site factories, are gathered inside the burn hole, on the burn hole stack. And finally, with the nanofacture operation, Yellow Player decommissions the refinery and the robonode and all their support chain to build a mobile factory or even a freighter right on the burn hole space. And now you understand how your remote burn hole can become an actual industrial center as long as you choose a good anchor point. At the end of the game, burn holes are worth victory points. A home burn hole gives 6 victory points. For a remote burn hole, it depends on its dirt side network, victory points being equal to the sum of all dirt side hydration values. In our previous example, at the end of the game, Yellow Player will earn 5 victory points for this remote burn hole. Note that Yellow Burn Hole would gain victory points for every adjacent factory, even if owned by another player. For example, with this factory, Yellow Player would earn 2 more victory points. But wait, there is more. Burnal cards can be promoted. We already saw the promotion operation in our previous video. Usually, to promote a card, you must bring it to a colony that fits this card's promotion prerequisite. This prerequisite looks like a dome with a symbol on it. This burnal must reach a colony on an astrobiology site to be promoted. Okay. But as you know, a burn hole seldom lands on any site. It usually stays in orbit. So here, to do the promotion operation, it only needs to be anchored to a colony matching the promotion prerequisite. With this burn hole card, Yellow Player can bring his burn hole adjacent to an astrobiology site where he previously settled a colony. Then he anchors his burn hole on this colony and then he can do the promotion operation and just flip his burn hole card to its purple side. This burn hole is now a lab. A lab is a burn hole on its promoted purple side. And first, a lab is still a burn hole and it keeps all the properties it had before promoting. A home burn hole remains a home burn hole and for example, it keeps its home privilege even if it is not written on the card's purple side. A remote burn hole remains a remote burn hole and can, for example, still get the ET produce cards from its dirt sites. But on top of this, a lab gives a new lab privilege. 
This ability is written on the lap card. Here, for example, yellow player gains the skunk work privilege. From now, he can ignore any hand size limitation. This property is defined in the rules glossary. Okay, but that's usually not a big deal. If you want to promote your burn hole into a lab, that's mainly because a lab is a universal promotion site. That means that any other card with a purple side can come here on the lab and do the promote operation without considering the promotion prerequisite. For example, if yellow player brings a freighter to his lab, his promoted burn hole, he can just do the promotion operation and flip his freighter to its purple side even if the colony prerequisite is not met. And this is a very powerful ability because it will allow you to promote your freighter, your gigawatt thruster and your colonists much more easily. And that's it. You know how to build and anchor a burn hole and you know what benefits it brings. But sometimes you will have to unanchor your burn hole to release it and make it mobile again. For example, you could want to unanchor your home burn hole to move it to a remote position where you anchor it again so it becomes a remote burn hole. Unanchoring a burn hole is a free action, very easy as you will see. Let's take an example. A yellow player has a remote burn hole anchored in the NISA asteroid family. For some reason, he would like to get it mobile again to fly elsewhere. He previously promoted this burn hole on its purple side. An anchoring is not an operation but a free action. Yellow player just removes his burn hole's dome. As you remember, the dome on the burn hole is what shows that it is anchored. If you take it off, it is no longer anchored. It's as simple as that. Then you keep the dome and you put it on a dirt side factory adjacent to the burn hole. So, if we do the balance sheet, yellow took a dome from his reserve when anchoring his burn hole and now while unanchoring, he keeps this dome on a dirt side. All in all, he gained a dome. Okay, but here you can see a problem. When you unanchor a burn hole, that's to make it mobile again. And it will be mobile only if it can activate its thrust triangle with the required support chain. Here, yellow player's burn hole card needs a generator. So let's suppose, for our example, that he previously brought or produced a generator there. And now yellow burn hole becomes a spacecraft and is mobile again. Yellow player can freely and immediately refill it with as much dirt fuel as he wants. This fuel comes from the dirt side just before an anchoring. If the burn hole was promoted on its purple side, it stays promoted after an anchoring. And voila, yellow burn hole can now move as a spacecraft. Of course, whether the burn hole is a home burn hole or a remote burn hole or even a lab on its purple side, as soon as it is not anchored anymore, it loses all its burn hole capabilities and advantages. Ok, that's fine, but in their very essence, burn holes are space colonies and they are made to settle human populations far into space. So, now that you know everything there's to know about burn holes, it's time to talk about the people who will dwell in these colonies. It's time to talk about colonists. Colonists are special cards added to the game with module 2. Each card represents a population of specialized people who can work in your industrial facilities. This card, for example, is a group of engineers. They have a mass and a radiation hardness because they can be transported in a spacecraft just as all other cards. Colonists are humans, so they can repair glitches or gain glory by exploring new sites or commit or avoid felonies. This symbol shows that the colonist card can be promoted if brought to a colony, a dome, matching the prerequisite. Once promoted, it is flipped on its purple side. More on that later. There are four kinds of colonists. Engineers, prospectors, miners and industrialists. And there are also non-human robot colonists. Ok, now let's see how it works. 
Colonies are set up as a shuffle deck, but this deck doesn't belong to the market. Players cannot buy colonists with a research action. Colonists are not patterns nor items that you could boost or produce. They are humans and the way you get them is quite peculiar. Colonies are linked to burnals. Building burnals is your only way to attract new colonists. The rule is simple. You must have one colonist for each burnal, for each anchored burnal. This is called exomigration. This is a free action, free, automatic and mandatory. At any point during the game, the number of human colonist cards a player owns must be equal to his number of anchored burnals. A lab, a promoted purple anchored burnal, gives two colonists. If a player has not enough colonists to reach this number, he immediately and automatically draws one colonist card from the deck. This colonist card, like a crew card, goes to LEO or home burnal stack, you never keep colonist cards in your hand. And so, with two anchored burnals, you will own two human colonists, up to a maximum of four colonists if both your burnals are on their purple side. As soon as you draw a new colonist, you also add a delegate, a cube, in the assembly on the space matching the colonist color that you can find on top right of its card. For example, this colonist adds a delegate in the purple space of the assembly, a yellow delegate because the player who drew it is the yellow player. As the new delegate is added to the assembly, players check if there is a change in political balance and current regime and laws. These rules are detailed in my video about module 0. Ok, now we know where colonists come from, they come from burnals. But how colonists can be useful, what to do with them? First, as colonists, they can colonize. And this can be very simple. Just because they are humans, you can transport them onto one of your factories, and there, with the free build colony action, you decommission your colonists and add a dome on your factory. The decommissioned colonist immediately goes to the bottom of the colonist deck and because this brings the total number of your colonists below the number of your burnals, it immediately and automatically triggers the exo-migration free action. That is, you draw a new colonist card and put it into LEO or on your home burnal stack. And so, you always keep the right number of colonists. But better than that, colonists are more effective than crews at colonization. That's their job. And players can use the new homesteading operation to urge colonists to travel and settle by themselves. First, you must give to your colonists some technological incentive in the form of a black card located on LEO or on your home burnal a black card that you discard to the bottom of its deck. That means that you must previously have E.T. produced this black card on one of your factories and brought it back to LEO or home burnal. And then you lose it. This is not a decommission. You discard the black card to its deck and you will no longer own it. The type of the black card doesn't matter. Any black card will do the job. Then, you decommission a colonist card wherever it is located. This card goes to the bottom of its deck, but is immediately replaced by the exomigration automatic free action. And then, you can put a dome on any of your factories wherever it is. So, as you see, the colonists travel through space to the factory is abstracted. They just need a black card as an industrial gift and they cross the solar system by their own means. Colonists are also specialists, and you can use them to support your operations. In game terms, you are usually limited to only one operation per turn, and with the growing number of possible operations, you can feel how it becomes more and more restrictive. Luckily, colonists can bring you some bonus operations. Every colonist has a profession. There are four possible professions, miner, prospector, industrialist, and engineer. 
A miner allows the bonus refuel operation where he is located. A prospector allows a bonus prospection or promotion operation where he is located. An industrialist allows a bonus industrialization or anchoring or nanofacture operation where he is located. And finally, an engineer allows to produce one more black card when performing an ET production operation. Beware, in this last case, this is not a bonus operation. The player must still perform an ET production operation as is only one operation for that turn, but then he produces a bonus black card. In all cases, the colonist himself must be located where the operation takes place, so it requires a little bit of planification, putting your colonists in a remote burner linked to a lot of dirt site factories, for example, can help him to be as efficient as possible. If that can help, I can show all these directly on the operations panel, each profession being linked to its operations. Let's write each profession beside its associated operation with the right colors. Perfect. Among the colonies deck, there are four black cards. These cards don't have the human symbol because they are not humans, they are robots. They have this gear symbol instead. There is one robot card for each profession, minor, prospector, industrialist and engineer. Robots are a special kind of colonist. During an exo-migration free action, when a player must take the top colonist card from the deck because he has fewer colonists than Bernals, it can happen that this card is a black robot colonist. In such a case, the player takes the robot card into his hand. Because the robot is a black card, it doesn't spawn on Elio or Hombernal like a human colonist. And while in hand, robots don't count toward the required number of colonists. Only colonists actually on the map do count. So, for example, when a player anchors his first Bernal, he must draw one colonist by exomigration. If this colonist is a black robot, he takes it in his hand and draws the next colonist card until he gets a human colonist, a white card, and spawns it to the map into Elio or Hombernal. To bring a robot colonist into play, the player must build it with the ET production on a matching letter factory. Beware, as soon as a robot is ET produced, it becomes a colonist on the map. So, it counts toward the total number of colonists, and if this number is greater than the number of burnals, two for a purple burnal, a colonist somewhere on the map must be decommissioned to comply with the required number of colonists. A black card does not have any vote logo. That means that playing a black robot card does not create a new delegate in the assembly. Robots are not humans, so they cannot do what only humans can do. They cannot build a colony by themselves, either by going to a factory or through the homesteading operation. They cannot remove glitches. They cannot gather glory. They cannot do felonies or avoid them. But, not being humans, robots can do what humans cannot. Robots can be sold on the free market for a cost matching their letter. A robot can be decommissioned at will. Just remember that if it is on the map, it counts as a colonist, and if it is decommissioned, it must be replaced thanks to an automatic exomigration action. Talking about colonists and burnout balance, just don't forget to always check this balance. As a quick example, let's say you decide to unanchor a burn hole, you must immediately decommission one colonist to keep the balance. Finally, robots do the jobs they were designed to do. They have a profession and so provide the corresponding free operation. In some unlikely circumstances, especially at high players count, a player can have to draw a colonist card through exomigration, but find the colonist deck empty. This case is called robots emancipation because then all players owning robots in their hand, not on the map, 
must immediately discard them and make them available. From this moment on, robots are considered as humans. They are not billed as black cards anymore. They spawn at LEO as white colonist cards. They gain all humans' capabilities and lose all non-humans' properties. Okay, now you know all about colonists. All but one last thing, one last but very important thing. What is the link between a freighter, a gigawatt thruster and a colonist? All these three cards can be promoted and have some special blue text on their purple side. This blue text is a future. Freighters, gigawatt thrusters and colonists are the only three kinds of cards that provide futures. We will see just now what are these futures, but for now let's say they are a big source of victory points. They are one of your main goals in this game, so they are very important. And if you get several of them, you'll get more opportunities for victory, and that's how important they are. Now remember, you can only own one freighter card and only one gigawatt thruster, but up to four colonist cards. And so, that's another reason to get colonists to get more futures. Promotion for colonists works as usual. You bring your colonist card to an existing colony that match the card's DOM prerequisite. You flip it and that's it. A promoted colonist gains a special ability and it gives a new future. So what are these futures? Let's take our colonist as an example. This one promises a TNO future for humanity TNO for Trans-Neptunian Object. To reach this future, you need to comply with the requirements, installing two factories on Neptune Zone. Let's check the map. Neptune Zone is a large zone, but the furthest one from Earth. There are a lot of available sites in this zone, but very difficult to reach. And so, to win this future, the player must build two factories on such remote sites. Okay, but... That's not enough. In order to fully fulfill a future, a player must also perform a special operation, a three-step operation. First, he must meet the requirements. In our example, own two factories in the Neptune zone. Then, he must bring the very card bearing the future to one of these sites. And, he must also bring a human card, a card with the human triangle symbol, to that same site. There must always be a human witness to fulfill a future. In the case of a colonist future, the future card and the human card can be the same card. And finally, futures are risky things. It needs an epic hazard roll. Contrary to its name, it's a standard hazard roll. On a result of one, the human card is decommissioned and the future is not fulfilled. Note that the future card itself is not decommissioned unless it is the same card as the human card. FINAO, failure is not an option, is possible. You can pay 4 aquas to pass the test without rolling the die. And all that counts as your operation for the turn. Ok, back to our example. Yellow player built two factories in the Neptune zone. Now, he must bring his future card and a human card to one of these factories. In our case, it can be the same colonist card. Then, he makes a hazard roll and pass it. Usually, futures are so difficult to fulfill that it's better to pay FINAO to avoid the die roll. And when all that is ok, yellow player at last wins an orange star. That means he reached this goal. This star is worth victory points at the end of the game. Here, 12 victory points, that's huge. Even if he doesn't fulfill this future's requirement at the end of the game, the star is here to remind that he deserves his 12 victory points. The fulfilled future also gives a special ability called an effect. Here, for example, yellow player will be able to do the homestead operation for free to send colonies to colonize faraway factories as often as he wants. This is a huge advantage and this effect is linked to the orange star. That means that yellow player will be able to use it even if this future card 
is later decommissioned or discarded. Effects and victory points are permanent. Once gained, they cannot be lost. And now let's summarize. Futures are available on purple side of freighters, gigawatt thrusters and colonists. To complete a future, you must perform a special operation that requires 1. to fulfill the future's requirements, 2. to bring the future card plus a human card on the future site, and 3. to pass a hazard roll or to pay for FINAO. Then, you earn an orange star that is worth victory points at the end of the game and that gives some special effects. On some futures card, you find the word endgame. That means that these future victory points and effects are only active if still fulfilled at the end of the game. On this example, this future must be activated as any other futures. Check all three steps we already know. But, moreover, its player earns two victory points per astrobiological colony he actually owns at the end of the game and not at the moment he activates his future card. On some other cards, you find the words Ad Astra. That means that the goal of this future is to send a human colony out of our solar system. These Ad Astra futures represent very challenging goals. They are associated with three possible solar system exits. So first, you need to bring the future card to one of these three exits, the card with all its support chain. That is, in our example, two reactors of any type, one generator and a big enough radiator. Then, two colonies promoted to their purple side as instructed on the card, and finally, a mobile factory. With all this on a solar system exit, the player will still have to roll the hazard or pay for FINAO. And after that, he will have to decommission all the cards because everybody leaves the solar system to some far, far away destination. Decommissioned colonist cards go to the bottom of their decks because you cannot keep them in your hand. That's a huge cost and that's what Adastra Futures are about. The next special indication on future cards are the words casus belli. They mean that fulfilling this future counts as a declaration of war against the other players. War. Yes, there can be war in High Frontier for All. You thought this was a game about engineering and space conquest, but not only. You can also choose the violent way and try to build your empire upon war and destruction. There is even a full module of rules dedicated to war, this is module 3, conflict. So, the best way to enjoy this part of the game is to include module 3 and listen to my next video about this module. But still, you can choose to stop at module 2 and there are special temporary rules to manage war without module 3, here they are. In High Frontier for All, module 2, if a player fulfills a future bearing the words casus belli, a state of war immediately begins between this player and all the others. At first, a war is pretty simple. All government and administration on Earth cease to function. And this until the end of the game, when a war starts in High Frontier Module 2, it never stops. First, without Earth administration, there are no banks, so no aquas. Player cannot earn nor spend aquas until the end of the game. All operations related to Earth are forbidden, so no fundraising, no research, no free market, no boost. Players can still get top cards from the market as an ersatz to research operation. This is free, but the card comes without any support chain cards. Because the boost operation is no longer available, these cards can only be produced on their black side with ET production. No engineers on Earth, so no FINAO. Players can gather glory cheats, but cannot bring them back to Earth. Out-of-Earth operations remain possible. Exo-migration still works. Burnholes still attract new colonists. The player who triggers the casus belli becomes the independent, a sort of rebel. As such, he can still use homesteading to send colonists all over the solar system. 
the other players called loyalist cannot. Space has become a dangerous place for non-rebel colonists. There are no more actions inside the assembly, but loyalists can still do lobbying with their existing delegates. Independent player cannot. Independent player can still use his faction privilege, but not his home burner privilege. And this is the opposite for loyalist players. At the end of the game, victory points value for factories are reduced to two victory points regardless of market value. There is no market anymore because of war. If another player triggers another casus belli while a war is already running, this player just joins the independent side, the rebellion. In module 2, there is no way to end a war, nobody can lose nor win, it will just last until the end of the game. And finally, the four robot colonist cards on their promoted purple side bear a future with a special prerequisite, robots not emancipated, and these same cards as an effect emancipate the robots. As you remember, we already talked about robot emancipation. Usually, robot emancipation happens when there are no human colonists available anymore. So, if this event has not yet happened, this future card can trigger it. Robot emancipation means that there is no difference between humans and robots anymore. Robot colonies becoming just as if they bore a human symbol. And that's it. Futures are a very profitable way to earn victory points. As soon as you get freighter, gigawatt thruster or colonies cards, quickly take a look at their futures on their back. These are new goals for you and only you that can shape your strategy for the rest of the game. And while we are talking about strategy, before wrapping up this video, let's try to have some global and quick view on High Frontier for All, including all rules up to now. So, at the core of the game, there's what we can call a basic cycle. A cycle centered around the rocket. You start with aquas, with the research operation you buy cards, then you boost these cards to make a rocket that will explore the solar system and perhaps gather some glory. But more important than that, your rocket claims sites through prospecting. Then, on claimed site, it is possible to build factories. And at this point, you get the first gears for your industrial engine. Because your factories can build cards on their improved black side without paying any aqua. In this process, the letters on the sites are crucial. Factories can also produce your fuel and so your aquas. Finally, you can install humans in your factories to make colonies. And there it is, the basic cycle in High Frontier for All, and the first source for your victory points. With module 0 comes the assembly. With its delegates, the assembly is a way to tweak the rules and the victory points. It does not change the basic balance of the game. Then comes the freighter in module 1, the big cube. And more than that, the mobile factories when the freighter is promoted on its purple side. This adds more spacecraft to the game. Before module 1, players are limited to only one spacecraft, their rocket, so only one movement per turn. Freighters and mobile factories give a lot more transportation for your cards. Note that this addition gives a real importance to colonies because colonies become the way to promote your purple cards and especially the sites where colonies are become crucial. And there comes the gigawatt thruster and its promoted version, the terawatt thruster and their yellow isotope fuel. These are just more efficient thrusters. They open the game to remote locations that were quite unreachable before. In module 1, you also get space elevators that facilitate access to large sites, those sites that require powerful thrusters to land on. Space elevators with a little bit of prior planning open the exploitation of these sites. And then we have module 2 with its burn holes. Home burn and remote burn -all. 
Homeburnall is usually the first you build. At last, it gives you a steady income. And it unlocks your privileges. Also, your home burn -all makes it easy to build your second burn -all, the one you can send far away as a remote burn -all. First of all, a remote burn -all acts as a super elevator. Anchored on a site, it can exploit it without having to land on it. And if you find the perfect location, you can establish your burn -all as an industrial network at the center of a web of dot site factories. You can then mass produce and even grow your network by producing mobile factories with the nanofacture operation. Burn holes also give direct victory points at the end of the game. Okay, that's fine, but above that, with automatic exo migration, both your burn holes attract colonists. Colonists give you free operation depending on their profession. And at this point, your industrial and economic engine is done. Up to you to optimize it to get the most operation and transportation to build always more resources, more factories, more colonies. This demands a lot of planning and you'll need pen and paper to sketch what your resources are, what letters on what sites and colonies, what special capabilities on what cards, what privileges, etc. And how you will make the better use of them. And when you are comfortable with this whole engine, you can go one step ahead. Freighters, gigawatt thrusters and colonists, when promoted to their purple side, give futures. And futures are the targets you will aim during the game. Futures give special powers and often a lot of victory points. On their promoted side, burnals become labs and labs make it far easier to promote other cards and so far easier to unlock futures. And voila, here is an overview of iFrontier for All, core rules plus module 0, module 1 and module 2. I hope this will help you to design your own plan and to adapt to what cards you will get and what opportunities you will find. Next video, we will add module 3 that will transform your peaceful engineering game into a cruel space war game.